Hey, Dustin Vanoy here. In this video, I'm going to show you how we create a full but simple Apache Spark application using Spark SQL. Um, so I recorded a longer video already where I show how to create your first PySpark application. I encourage you to look at that either right, right after this one or right before if you haven't seen it. Um, but in this video, we're going to create that same type of application, but with only SQL. So check out the notes on the description for this video for any links and things that may complement the video. Don't forget to check out some of the other videos in this series, Apache Spark Data Kickstart. Okay, so let's get started by uh, starting up some sort of Spark environment that allows programming with Spark SQL. Uh, there's a variety of options for this, but I'm going to use Databricks Notebooks from the Community Edition. And that's how I'll demonstrate and you can follow along. Um, if you have other Spark environment like uh, Azure Synapse Spark or running Spark locally, uh, you can also do very similar commands to get the same types of results. Um, at the end of this video, I will show you how we can do this locally using the Spark SQL REPL and a few of the different configs that need to be set up to work with Spark 3.3. Okay, let's jump into this hands-on tutorial now. Okay, here we are in Databricks Community Edition, and I've got my notebook Spark SQL Kickstart first application. You can find this on my GitHub, by the way, um, but let's walk through what's going on here. Uh, are using the New York City taxi data. And at the end, I'll show you how you could go download this if you're not running from a Databricks environment. But if you are in any Databricks environment, you'll have it under the Databricks datasets path. Okay, the first thing we're going to do uh, in order to work with the CSV file is to drop it if it exists and create a new table uh, using the CSV format. So let's go ahead and run that and we'll talk through it really quickly here. So um, we're creating the table with a specific table name. We are telling it the format that we want to use, in this case, CSV for comma separated value. Um, there's a few ways you can do this for sure with Spark SQL, but since I have headers that I need to specify, uh, on line five, you'll see I use the options. And then within options, I give it a path to where that file exists. I give it a header is true, and I give it the infer schema true, where it's going to actually look at the data in the CSV and infer the schema from there. This is, um, Probably a little slower than it would if I ran it again because it's got to initialize that Spark session and run the command. Um, but this is going to create an external table on top of the CSV file that I can then reference in additional SQL queries. Uh, as that's running, let's go ahead and talk through the next cell. So the next piece is a create or replace a yellow trip SQL transformed as the table name. Uh, in this, I'm basically going to select everything from my CSV data set and do some transformations. Um, I've talked about these in PySpark. In this case, uh, it might look slightly different because I've put it into a select statement. But within my select statement, lines four, five, six, seven, I'm doing some different transformations. On line four, I do a regular expression replace, which is going to build um, a month field with underscores instead of dashes. And that's something I can use for partitioning and things like that. Uh, within line five, I'm doing a two date transformation to go from a string into a date field. And to, uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, truncate the timestamp and have just the date. Same thing in line six, just for a different date time field that's in this system. Uh, and then finally on line seven, I'm just taking the tip amount divided by total amount, uh, which is like the percentage of total amount that was tip. Okay. And then I have a from clause, which is going to specify a table. In this case, I don't have this long um, multi-part schema where I specify a catalog, a schema, and then a table name. I'm simply specifying a table name, and this would be in the default location in this case. And then finally, I guess I should mention, on line nine, we've got a limit 1,000, which says take the first 1,000 records you encounter. Don't read the whole table. So um, if you do this with more of a wildcard in the first step, then you'll get more than one month worth of data. But in my path, I specified one month. If you ignore the limit 1000, you'll have a much bigger set of work that's going to happen in this cell. But for me, this is going to be a pretty small table that gets created. And the reason is so you can easily run this and see it happen. Uh, and you don't spend a bunch of time creating a table that's just for demonstration purposes. Okay, that's going to run in process. Let's take a look at the next step as that's happening. The next step is to create a table called zone SQL source. In this case, I'm using CSV again, and I'm specifying options very similar to what I did for my first cell. Uh, this is going to be the taxi zone data, which is used 
uh, when I do a join in a moment. And so it's basically going to say using the pickup location ID or the drop off location ID, depending on which way I want to go, um, join to this table and give me names of zones and uh, information related to the location. OK, so I can see if I look back, I can see my last one took 30 seconds just to get a thousand records and save those in a delta table. Now I'm going to run this one and it should be fairly quick to create that external table on top of zone SQL source. If you've heard me say external table and you're wondering what that is, the short part of it is that uh, external table says, I've already got data in a location, create a schema on top of it, don't move that data. Very importantly is that if I go drop that table, that data that I'm built it on top of will not go away. So the data lives independent of the schema and I'm specifying the schema as an external table. Uh, in these places, like the, la the uh, trip SQL transformed, I'm actually creating a new table which would be managed, and um, that means if I go back and drop it, it would it would go away, and the data would be deleted as well. Okay, so it changes a little bit about how things will interact. Depending on your environment, it can mean a lot more. Um, but uh, if we're talking general open source Apache Spark, it's more about is the schema separate from the data. Okay, so now when I do a um, the next step I want to do is do a join on the SQL transform, the yellow trip SQL transformed, I should say, and the zone SQL source, um, which will give us some lookup information. So this is a Databricks specific thing right here. I'll show you a open source version of this. But for Databricks, I can do select star accept a single field. And um, that just saves me some time trying to write out all my taxi zone fields that I care about. I'm going to uh, create or replace table, which means I'm going to overwrite this table every time I do it. Uh, that's not uh, necessarily common uh, in uh, in kind of a final destination table like this would probably represent. Um, but for demonstration purposes, it's a fine way to go. Now I'm going to do a join and there's a variety of joins in SQL. The types are pretty similar and pretty standard in Spark SQL, but we've got an inner join would say if my trip table um, finds a match in taxi zone, then keep both records and uh, make the columns from taxi zone available as well. The left join is saying, re even if I don't find a matching taxi zone, keep the data from the trip records and just give me empty columns, blank columns for zone because there's not a match there. Okay. And then in the on clause, I'm going to say, give me a uh, ID from trip table and an ID from the taxi zone table. In this case, pick up location ID equals taxi zone location ID. Right, so let's run this. And again, since I've limited to a thousand records, my lookup table for zone is not too long. This should actually run pretty quick as well. There we go. So we've just done, we could have done more transformations in this step instead of just a select star, but we've just taken data from multiple sources, done some amount of transformations, joined it together. We have not aggregated the data. We've not started to do like sums and things to get up to like a daily level of trip uh, aggregations, trip calculations that are important. Um, but that would be another step you might do, especially if you're writing this in SQL, that tends to be a way that I would go and do my aggregations is by pulling up a SQL notebook and using uh, tables that I created either with SQL or with PySpark to get the data loaded. Finally, without all the aggregations added, let's just prove that we can run a select star from that destination table and get the top thousand rows back pretty quick. Okay, so what I'm talking about with aggregations would be if I wanted to do something like a sum of total amount um, and then do it by the uh, some of the zone information. Let's take a quick look at what those fields are. So we can use the zone field, why not? Look at that information by zone. I can set this aggregation, group by zone, run this query, and I'm gonna have like my latest all time totals of amount by zone. Um, so that's kind of a very simple aggregation that we can do with SQL. Once you start getting to the grouping and the, and the aggregations, I find that writing it in SQL is more natural for me, but I'm also someone who spent, you know, the first seven to 10 years of my career doing a lot of SQL development. And so SQL is kind of a natural language for me to go back to. Um, some people really prefer to do all of this in PySpark or maybe Scala Spark, and, and that's okay. It's all supported there. It just looks a little bit different.
Okay, a couple, one more tip I think for the notebook here is that I can take a look at um, how my table was created and where that data is stored and what the data types are and some of this other information by doing describe formatted. And I kept this in here to show as I was building this, I wanted to take a look back at where did it actually store this data because I didn't specify a location and is this a managed or not managed table? So to call that out um, here highlighted now is the managed table. So it would say external in one of my other tables. That was an external table. And then the location is using what's the default location user hive warehouse at this point. If I were to use a database and set up, or sometimes we call it a schema in Spark, and set up that database or schema to have a de destination, a location related to it, then when I create a table the way I did, it would save it in that location rather than this default user hive warehouse location. So something to keep in mind, because often for production use cases, we want to actually save into a different location than this. And you can either set that as you create the table or set that at a database level. All right. Um, let's take a look then at one last thing, which is if I want to set that location, here's what it looks like. Okay. So this is me creating a similar type of table to what I just showed, except uh, as I mentioned, I'm setting the location here rather than taking the default for the database or the default for my whole environment. Once I do that, it creates a table that ends up looking pretty much the same, if not the same. When I describe formatted and scroll down a bit, I'm gonna see that it is now considered an external table, but it did also create um, where create the data set as well and save the data set to where I specified. Um, so that's a difference if you specify location when creating a table. Uh, it's kind of up to you how you want to manage your data and which way you go with that. All right. Now that was how we do this in a notebook like in Databricks. Uh, if you're in Synapse Spark or some of the other notebook environments, it should be pretty similar. Um, let's take a look at if I'm doing this locally. In addition, if you're not within Databricks, you might find that some of this part helps you um, figure, <laughs> figure out how to do this outside of Spark, um, including the fact, sorry, outside of Databricks, I should say. Um, so here's how we can do this locally or from potentially other environments besides Databricks. One step, if you didn't follow my PySpark uh, session, is that we will want to copy down the files. So for like a bash command on Linux, I'm using Windows subsystem for Linux, I can copy and paste this code to download data, uh, put it in the folder specified, and then reference it in the next steps. Okay, um, when I start up locally, there's some things about Delta Lake that need to be configured. And I also found that right now, May 9th, 2023, uh, Del Spark 3.4 does not have Delta Lake support in the open source um, environments yet. If it's not built into the managed environment you use, I would say use Spark 3 right now and use um, the Delta Lake version specified in this command. Probably very soon, maybe by the time you see this video, um, Delta Lake will have another version that matches Spark 3.4 and you can up the up the uh, the settings here to be 3.4, uh, the version that matches Spark 3.4. Okay, all right. So before we run these commands, let me go start up my local Spark session. Okay, so now I'm in my local environment. I'm going to uh, start up my uh, virtual environment where I've got PySpark 3.3 installed. Now that I've got PySpark installed, I can paste that command that I copied from my notebook, and that's going to call, that's going to end up calling Spark SQL. Um, plus, it's going to specify the package for Delta, which right now is 2.3.0. That's what you would change to be maybe 2.4.0 once the new version comes out and you're on Spark 3.4. And then you're going to set some things about the Spark session extension, um, the Delta catalog um, as, the deep, as the Spark catalog. And then finally, this is optional, but that last config is setting the SQL warehouse directory to a location that I wanted to. Um, you could leave that to be the default and it'll um, pick whatever the default location is. Okay, as it's running this, it's going to get those uh, Delta dependencies if it doesn't already have them. Okay, we have a Spark SQL prompt now after all of that. Let's go ahead and paste in our commands. So this is very similar to what I did above. The main difference is that now my location is uh, temp data sets and I'm using Parquet instead of, I think I did a CSV version before. 
So I'll paste that into Spark SQL. It'll warn me about pasting, no big deal. And it should run both the drop statement and gives me a little warning about um, a database that isn't mapped, but that's okay. You'll get, uh, if you have a similar experience to me, you'll see some different warnings throughout this. And um, what I've seen is that most of these warnings aren't really critical for testing things out and working locally. All right, so I created that table. Let's jump to the next step then. So now we have the code to create the transform table. And we had the issue of that table already existing. Apparently I did not put a drop statement in. Okay, so the, now you can see why I have that drop statement. If you did this for the first time, you probably didn't have an issue. Um, for me, that was a problem because I've run this earlier to make sure it worked and forgot to run it a second time to make sure it was gonna work for my demo. Okay, so we've copied this cell for the yellow trip SQL transformed, get a fresh prompt, paste it in. First we drop if it exists. Again, in my environment that does something, might not in yours. Um, and it looks like here I've got an issue with the location I'm trying to specify. So it seems to me like the location was not um, cleared out when I dropped the table. So if that is the case, you could from terminal go and delete the location, delete everything from that location. I will go ahead and do that and keep the location as is. I'll do that with a new terminal session. Zoom this in a little bit. And I can just do a remove statement for that directory. If you're going to run commands like a remove, please make sure you know where you're at, what you're doing. Don't do this on production, do this more in a test or local environment where if you accidentally delete a whole bunch of important stuff, you're not gonna get fired for it. Here we go, let's get a fresh start. We're going to run this uh, command for creating this transform table. There we go, that table was created as well. Now let's jump to the next step. Here we're going to create the zone SQL source table. Voila, pretty simple on that one. And now we'll create our own version of that manage table. Um, notice that I still have a join. This looks pretty similar. The main thing is that I don't have the accept statement in this uh, environment I'm in. So I can specify the taxi zone fields I care about. Um, or I could have just left that location ID in. It wouldn't have hurt anything. It was just redundant because I already had a pickup location. Okay, so we copy our yellow trips sample managed, paste that in locally. I've cleared out the place that this data was from before, so this should work. And there we go, we've created that table as well. And then finally, let's do a select from there. And we get uh, the first thousand rows, which I think I still limited that to just a thousand. Um, probably the last thing we can do is take a quick look at what the table format is. There we go. We can take a look and see that um, it's storing it in the location I used in my config uh, for where I want to store it. It's using the default schema or database name. Uh, and is there anything else interesting here? It tells us it's not partitioned, which is a nice thing to be aware of. So that's uh, an example of doing all this same stuff uh, in the local environment for those that are trying to do this locally instead. So there we go. That's our tutorial. Hopefully that didn't seem too challenging. It actually feels a little bit a simple and not too many steps to me. Um, so when I say for your first application, I hope you don't feel like that wasn't enough to feel accomplished because we actually did read data, processed it, joined it, and wrote it down to a Delta table that would be ready for um, potentially some analytics queries or the next steps in a larger data pipeline. Okay, so uh, stay tuned for more Apache Spark Data Kickstart content as well as other content that I'll release on my channel. I'm um, definitely uh, subscribe to this and keep an eye out so you can join me on the next one. See you next time.